nice to be here to talk to you about um, what is a, a very significant topic, uh, not just uh, to the world, but also to us here in Jersey. We're going to talk about islands, we're going to talk about biodiversity in islands. And, but first of all, I'm going to take you through the description and um, classification of what an island is, why we think it's so important, and then look at the threats, what is actually sort of happening that is damaging the biodiversity of an island, and then, only then, what are we going to do about it? And I think the, the message that I want to put across to all of you from the very start of the lecture is that indeed no man is an island. Even an island is not an island. An island may be an island because it is geographically isolated from the continent, but essentially we're dealing with interconnectivity, connectivity throughout the world. And that is the main theme of what I'm going to tell you today. I think it's also quite important for us to understand what we can do about uh, diminishing biodiversity, and we also need to understand, like I said before, so the whole connections of um, life on Earth. And life on Earth, so biodiversity, biological diversity, is very important not just for its own sake, but it's very important for humankind. I mean, after all, we are dependent, humans are dependent on the biological diversity that's found around us. It is not a question of just saying we love our animals, we love our plants and we need to conserve that. We must actually do whatever we need to do in order to preserve what is very much a lifeline to a human being throughout the world. And I've started with the uh, quote from John Dunn's. Uh, John Dunn is an individual uh, in the Elizabethan times. Uh, this particular uh, poem or part of the poem was actually written in 1624. What well, is quite interesting is that in his famous uh, devotions upon emergent occasions and several steps, in my sickness, that would be a wonderful title for one of our journal papers these days. I don't think that would allow us to have anything longer than perhaps five or six words. But isn't it uh, incredible you know, to be able to write that way and to write about things that we think are mundane, you know, you know, an island, a continent, connections between sort of people and, uh, and islands and so on. And in fact, he was actually talking about him being sick and how the notion of Elizabethan uh, sickness or the notion of sickness in the Elizabethan times was very much connected to God punishing humankind for their sins. You became sick because you were um, committing sin and because you were committing sin, God was actually punishing you. It's not like that these days, of course. The whole notion of sickness and punishment by God is not a 1600 sort of uh, idea. But certainly I think it wouldn't be um, at all bad for us to think that we are causing sickness to the world and somehow a God or God will be punishing us for doing what we do to the world. So let's go by and um, you know, talk about what we mean by an island. Now the main sort of topic of our conversation today has to do with the definition of an island. And actually in many ways an island is um, easy to define, it's any area of land small on the continent, and entirely surrounded by water. And I think the operant uh, words or the definition of the island comes around the surrounded by water bit because any area of land <coughs> on the continent can be anything from a pebble <coughs> in the sea to a big island like, for example, Australia. The definition of islands is interesting, is um, a bit semantic, but at the same time it's important for us in conservation to know what we're dealing with when we talk about islands, when we talk about island biology, island biogeography, etc. So let's say that an island is a de a an area of land which is surrounded by water, but is not as small as, you know, a lump of rock in the middle of uh, a beach, for example, as we see in, in Jersey. And it certainly can be as big as Australia, but not quite. I'm actually saying this because 
Semantics and classifications is always a bit of a problem for us in biology because things are not often as clear as we think they are. So islands, areas of land surrounded by water, if we carry on with the definition that an island is something relatively large or not too small, and I'm being very vague with the definition there, we probably have <coughs> approximately about 180,000 islands around the world. The thing is that when we talk about islands, we're talking about two very different types. We may be talking about oceanic islands, as those pieces of land that actually emerge from the sea, from volcanic activity, and they are completely isolated from the, uh, the rest of the land. It has never had a connection with the continental mass. We can have, of course, continental or land bridge islands, and these are simply unsubmerged parts of the continental shelf that have remained there after there's been a sea level rise. And I'll show you an example of that sort of island later on. So land bridge islands are quite interesting because in many ways they've got fauna and flora, which is similar to what you find in the continent, but may have been isolated for long periods of time Therefore, it has a tendency to become different. I say tendency because I, when you are isolated on an island, you tend to evolve, evolve into different forms. And again, we'll see that a bit later on. So you can have wonderful land islands like these in the, the Sunda Shelf in, in Malaysia, or you can have some magnificent places like Bioko Island, which is a continental island off the continent of Africa, in the Bight of Biafra, uh, certainly connected to the continent to about 10,000 years or so, and containing fauna and animals beautiful as a grill in these you know, fantastic high volcanic peaks that are found in that island. And the other island, like a typical continental island, was actually connected, like I said, to the continent um, you know, about 18,000 years before present, in the case of Ryoko. The sea level was about less than, actually, uh, about 120 meters below what we have at the moment. 12,000 years later, at 12,000 years, minus 18 meters, minus 60 at 9,000 sea level since 5,000 BP before present, and of course, this, this actually means that since for 5,000 years or so, whatever was found on that island, even though it was similar to what was found on the continent, had time to change and evolve and become something different. Of course, 5,000 years is not enough to actually change, to become different, to, to change the forms that are found on the island. But we do have certain aspects uh, or certain uh, elements happening, certain factors or uh, things happening on night, such as this one, and that is the relaxation of faunas, as we call it, when a piece of land is isolated from the rest of the continent. <coughs> this actually means that large animals, that elephants that used to roam between this particular part of the continent, and this is Mount Cameroon in Africa, and the Oko Island, back and forth, where it remained on the Oko Island since 5000 BP, and bit by bit they have disappeared because obviously that patch of land is not big enough for viable populations of species. So, what is happening in these continental islands, or what am I doing, uh, is that um, you have forms that were there in the past but have remained because of that sea level rise. Volcanic well, islands are, are very different. They emerge directly from the surface and the seafloor because of volcanic activity. They're therefore volcanic in themselves. This is uh, one of the islands sort of off uh, the Philippines, and just starting in fact, you can see it. This is an island, a volcanic island in the Galapagos, very typical volcano, Caldera, which is a crater. And inside the crater you have a lava pool which eventually gets uh, you know, covered uh, and therefore dormant and turns into a lake, as you can see in this particular part. 
You can have islands that uh, are still active. You know, volcanic activity is something that is continuously sort of happening throughout the world. And these volcanic islands, like this one off um, Iceland, is still active, even though there is a certain amount of life activity, shall we call it, around the areas which are still, or which are not actually sort of covered by ash and so on. So this uh, type of form is um, very typical of many parts of the world, and certainly in the, in the tropical areas. And what is very interesting about volcanic islands in themselves is that they can come, actually appear in the form of what we call a knife. There is a, a crack in the seafloor which actually allows or excuse uh, magma and lava and eventually you have a line of islands, as you can see in this particular image, that turns into wonderful places like the Hawaiian Islands. Here you have a line of uh, a, line, a, a volcanic arc that has islands of different ages that are emerging at different times that actually erode bit by bit and therefore the largest island that we have here, Hawaii, is actually a much younger island than the ones you have right at the very end of the island itself. This actually means that in terms of volcanic activity and geology, it is very interesting because you've got high, you know, earlier forms or you know, uh, older types, etc. But you also have different times for colonization of animals and plants onto those islands, which obviously will cause a certain amount of change in the biome on those islands and therefore in the evolution of the species that come within them. There are volcanic islands that turn into something else, something else in the sense that it's not going to be just one cone in the middle of nowhere. It's going to turn bit by bit into what we called atolls. And atolls become that eventually through a process of erosion of the actual central volcano, but also through coral reefs forming around it bit by bit until you have nothing in the middle and a line of corals or islands that surrounded the volcanic um, area, the volcano itself. Again, these are very interesting from a life uh, point of view because obviously you have a certain amount of colonizations of animals and plants in the volcano that eventually disappear. And then you have a secondary sort of colonization on the sides of the atolls that could be related to the animals and plants that are found in the middle of the volcano, but also through colonization of forms that came from the continental areas themselves. So islands are different, and they're different <coughs> to their origins, and essentially um, different according to where they are in the world. What I mean to say is that a temperate climate island, an island off the Shetlands, for example, has the same, can have the same origin of, as an island in the middle of the a tropical belt around the equator, but obviously the numbers of species that can actually end up on a temperate island is going to be far lower than the numbers of species that you're going to have in a tropical area. This is simply because there are latitudinal gradients in species diversity. There are more species around the equator than there are along the poles. So therefore, an island closer to the pole will always have less species, even though the form and the process of colonization may be exactly the same as an island in the tropics. But you've got islands that range, you know, from, like I said, a few square meters, if you take the definition down to the very bottom of the line, to the largest islands, which are, of course, Islands such as Greenland, which is the largest, about 2 million square kilometers, New Guinea, Borneo, Madagascar, Baffin Islands, Matra, etc. So, large islands are large islands, so large in many ways that they are almost similar to what we know as a continental area <coughs> of Australia. So, uh, this is why I said earlier that the definition of islands will get often entangled by where you draw the line in terms of how big is actually an island. So the island of Greenland is sufficiently big to make a comparison with Australia, as you can see here. The smallest island has always been a question of debate. Up until some years back, Bishop's Rock 
of the Scilly Islands uh, is actually considered to be the smallest island, at least the smallest island in Great Britain. That has been changed because obviously that mantle rock that you actually have now, a lighthouse, cannot be actually called an island. So the definition of the smallest island is still very much in debate, but from, from our point of view, from a biological point of view, I think we're actually interested in areas of land that are isolated that can actually be, in many ways, sort of laboratories for evolution, speciation machines, speciation factories throughout the world. There are many islands that have been discovered nowadays because obviously we have the advantage of satellite imagery, being able to zoom into these areas and actually find out more about these patches of land that are connected or were connected to the continent or have just actually emerged like that. And we've um, certainly a, similar, a study that has been done quite recently shows that about 657 new islands have been discovered by just using satellite imagery <coughs> to locate these uh, forms, uh, these landforms throughout the world. What is most interesting for us in the biological sense is that even though islands make up about 5% of the Earth's land area, it is, they are home to an estimated 20% of all the birds, <coughs> reptiles and plant species. So really a very important reservoirs of speciation, very important uh, reservoirs of biological diversity. Because 20%, almost a quarter, of all the vertebrates, in fact, uh, mammals not so much because mammals are quite difficult uh, you know, to actually reach these islands, usually just have bats in islands, but certainly for birds, for reptiles and plant species, islands throughout the world are extremely important in terms of biodiversity. <coughs> we also know that islands contain 40% of all critically endangered species and extinction rates are disproportionately greater than islands. We know since the 1500s that we have some data on extinction of species since that time that about 70 to 75 percent of at least the, the animals we know about, mostly birds and reptiles, have actually disappeared from islands. And disappeared from islands because of a series of pressures that we will see later on that has to do with the our entry of the colonization of these islands by humankind and the beasties that follow him or her. Eighty percent of those extinctions have occurred on islands, I'd say. I've actually mentioned between 70 and 75 percent, you know, it's, it's around that. And part of the problem with estimating extinction rates of animals and plants in these places is that we do have very little information of how many were there before. We have records that go back to about the 1500s, but obviously a lot of these records are not particularly um, you know, accurate, so we may be missing out quite a large number of species that have had disappeared since the 1500s, but we have no actual record of mention of these. For us in biology, we're incredibly interested about the process of you know, how many species can a particular piece of land uh, contain. And you may think that the whole idea of uh, what we call the species area curve, and numbers of species that can be found in areas of different sizes, is something which is, you know, taken, taken for granted, certainly taken for granted now, but it wasn't until the 1960s that we started thinking seriously about the relationship between land, the area of land, and the number of species. The species area curve is a construct that comes out in the 1960s, and it's one which we use constantly, not just in relation to islands, but in relation to biodiversity assessments throughout the world. What I mean to say is that when you look at an area, as the area goes up in size, the numbers of species that are found in that area goes up as well. There is a positive correlation between island area and numbers of species. Now there is a negative correlation between distance from the mainland, you know, where the source populations and the island, and the numbers of species that are found on the island. So the further away you are from the mainland, that makes a lot of sense, the less numbers of species are going to find in the island, uh, are going to be found in the island. So therefore, for us to understand the whole process of 
species packing and numbers of species in an area, in an island area, we have to take into account the size of the area, the size of the island, as well as the distance from the main. The distance to the source populations are incredibly important. If there are more species in the source populations, like I've said, in the tropics, you're likely to have more species on the island than if you are in the middle of the Shetlands or closer, even closer to the poles. So more species are found in bigger islands, fewer species are found on more isolated islands. And this is something which is sort of makes sense, but it has actually been brought up or put together by two eminent uh, biogeographers, the eminent biologists, MacArthur and Wilson, in the 1960s, to come up with what we know as the island uh, theory, the theory of island biogeography. So by actually understanding sort of, uh, the distances from mainland source populations, by actually understanding something about the size, or measuring the size of the island, by knowing the number of habitats are likely to be found on the islands, we can then come up with predictions on how many species are likely to get on those islands and how many species can that, and that island can actually sustain. And when you actually study the, this uh, particular relationship of um, you know, distance to mainland and, and numbers of habitats and area size, etc., when you study it in empirically, if you go to a place like the Caribbean, the Lesser Antilles, you see that this theory is not just a theory. It actually explains very clearly what you do see in the field. For example, if you look at bird species in relation to area of islands in the Lesser Antilles, you can see there is a positive correlation between the number of bird species you find and the size of the island, which is predicted and actually very clearly put together in the theory of island biogeography by MacArthur and Winston. And the same thing with reptiles and amphibians. Reptiles and amphibians, amphibians in particular less Antilles, have, have managed to occupy these islands. Many other islands have not been colonized by amphibians because it's actually rather difficult for amphibians to get all the way from where they are in the continent to the island across salty water. Amphibians don't particularly like salty water, and 200 kilometers, for example, as in the case of Satome Island, is rather a big barrier for amphibians to cross in order to colonize the island. And the same thing with butterfly species and bat species. This is, um, you know, good information or um, proof that this island biogeography theory actually works and is um, replicated in all the islands of the world that we have data for. Distance to mainland, like I said before, incredibly important as well. So if you look <coughs> at um, the birds that, um, around the islands, and close to all the birds that have actually emanated in many ways from New Guinea, you can see that there is a, a negative correlation relationship between the distance to New Guinea source population and the number of bird species that are found in these. Again, proof that you know, what has been said in terms of the island geography theory actually applies to these areas without any problem whatsoever. But as I said, there are two different forms uh, of islands that has a different, uh, that has a different impact on the faunas that are found and the faunas that are found within them. In the case of land rich islands, you start with a large-ish or sufficiently large number of species because you are connected to the mainland or were connected to the mainland, so therefore you've got the same level of species and numbers as you find in the mainland areas nowadays, but through time and because of isolation, you're going to have a loss of species, this species relaxation effect that we have on islands until eventually you reach an equilibrium. That equilibrium means that there are sufficient species for the resources that are found on the island and therefore, in theory, not many more species can actually take over, invade and become part of the community of species within that island. In the Oceanic Island scenario, we have something very different. You have the numbers of species actually increasing with time until you reach an equilibrium. In other words, the resources within the island are in line with the numbers of species that have formed the communities within them. 
But all of this has to do with this particular um, effect or this particular uh, issue. And that has to do with speciation. How do species become something else in life? Because one of the things that we are very excited about always is not just discovering new species, but actually knowing that there are wonderful species that are found in islands because they had become isolated there and because they had become a different form altogether. And here we've got two different forms of speciation. You've got a linear evolution uh, where you've got one species turning into another and then the ancestral form disappearing. Or you may have what we know as a branching evolution in which you've got an ancestral form giving rise to two different forms, usually because there is a separation, an isolation of populations between one and the other. And if that happens, you've got a number of situations in which you can have new species forming because they are isolated on a mass of land. And the classic example of anagenesis, for example, uh, of cladogenesis, uh, for example, or anacladogenesis, is basically when you have forms of life, life forms, isolated on an island and therefore becoming something different through time. Isolation is the biggest friend of evolution. If you have forms that do not contact, come into contact, after a, while, uh, after a while, populations are separated through from geographical barrier. These particular forms of populations can become and will become something very different. And that's exactly what is happening, mostly in oceanic islands, of course, where you've got that separation of the sea and a long time to change into other forms. And because of this process of isolation, of changing into something else, we have this idea of an endemism. An endemic species is a species that's only found in a particular area of the world. <coughs> now, like the definition of an island, definitions of endemicity or endemism is rather difficult, often because we have to define the land area that we are talking about. I always tell the students that if you were to take the entire galaxy, <coughs> You can talk about endemics, all of the plants and animals found on Earth, be endemic to Earth. You know, you take that unit of land as planets, and obviously everything is endemic to Earth. However, you can go to the other extreme, and I always like using the example of nematodes, you know, little worms that are found in wooden beer mugs that are found in Austrian beer gardens. If you go anywhere in Austria, apparently Germany and all these places, they've got these wooden beer mugs, and within these beer mugs, you will find endemic nematodes. So that's another definition of endemicity. You know, you can have something as big as a planet, or you can have something as small as a beer mug, or even apparently the sleeves of EMI records labels in the, uh, have endemic nematodes. So each one of these leaves in a record in the EMI factory or library or whatever they have, you know, have endemic nematodes. So for us it's very difficult to know where we're going to draw a line. But when we deal with endemicity at the level of the world, in terms of the world regions, etc., we tend to think of the isolation on islands, for example, as a means of talking about uh, as, as a means of talking about endemism. And now I'm going to give you some examples of endemic life forms, animals, I'm afraid, uh, that are found in islands throughout the world. Of course, the the most uh, wonderful one in my mind are the these Galapagos marine worms. These are reptiles that actually live in at the sea will actually eat the algae from the sea, and I actually have to um, manipulate their times in the water and out in the sun because the water around Galapagos Islands is incredibly cold because of the humble current, and these guys have actually adapted to those particular conditions have become something completely different. From a land animal to a marine animal, it has still obviously a link to the land itself. You've got wonderful uh, uh, examples of speciation of reptiles in the Caribbean, 
through uh, these uh, little lizards known as animals. There are animals throughout the Caribbean, and every single island, even the smallest of islands, have animals that have become something very different. This is the example of the Jamaican giant animal. This is a large and large, rather large uh, lizard that's found in some of the forests in, in Jamaica itself. There are small islands, for example, around the Bahamas, where you've got animals that, that have become something different because of isolation from these patches of land. The Grand Canary lizard, which is a, a lizard about this size, a rather enormous beast that are found in some of the islands in the, in the Canary Islands, are also there through the process of colonization and isolation and becoming something very different. Uh, and usually you get two different trajectories of species that are found in lions, at least vertebrate species. You can become smaller, you have dwarfism, or you can become larger, you can become giants. If you think of Komodo um, dragons, you know, lizards, monitor lizards, that are found in the island of Komodo in uh, Indonesia, these guys have become bigger, have become giants. You think of uh, uh, giant sunbirds in places like Sao Tome and Principe Islands in the Gulf of Guinea. These have become bigger. But there are also uh, examples of things becoming smaller. The examples of the pygmy hippos and pygmy elephants in the Mediterranean islands during the Pleistocene, for example, is another uh, case of uh, dwarfism of large forms uh, when they were large forms. So Canary Islands, that visit is a wonderful beast and very sort of typical of that particular archipelago. You have wonderful examples of hummingbirds, in this case it is a Juan Fernandez fire crown. Juan Fernandez is your Robinson Crusoe island. It's the island that actually inspired, um, well through examples, uh, through writings of uh, a guy called Selkirk who was isolated on these islands of Juan Fernandez. Uh, Daniel Defoe was able to write about the, the, uh, Robinson Crusoe. These islands have wonderful sets of endemics because of their isolation. Because once you get to these islands, you have nothing more to do except stay there and become something different, adapt to the conditions in which you find them. Fire Crown is a very wonderful example of not just speciation, but coloration and adaptation to the conditions of Juan Fernandez in particular. It's another example of uh, the fire crown. You can see what, what a wonderful sort of, uh, beast that it is. Uh, I think part of the enjoyment of doing biology is actually appreciation of nature itself. And for me, it's not just telling you about the process of speciation, but actually allowing you to appreciate the beauty of this nature, which is now found in very precarious places. Look at the, the blue chaffinch in the Canary Islands. <coughs> that has become that from that. So you can see sort of how the process has, in a way, um, dampened the colours, and you know, come up with a single colour, whereas in the case of the fire crown, you have this flurry of different colours, this uh, different way of looking at life, so to speak, in relation to, to these chaffinches. Frogs and amphibians are less common on islands, as I said, because of the difficulty of actually getting there across salty water. But we have one or two cases, for example, in the case of the Sao Tome giant uh, tree frogs, where they are, the islands are about 200 uh, kilometers away from the African mainland, <coughs> but for some reason they've made it to the islands and again have become something very different. The Sao Tome giant uh, tree frogs are rather substantial beasts in comparison to other tree frogs in the nearby <laughs> or relatively nearby mainland. Hispanula uh, and Salinodons, unique. They're unique not just because they're found on islands, but unique because they were part of a, a group of animals that used to roam the tertiary areas of North America. And through isolation, through plate tectonics, separation of the continents and all that, you know, you have this beast, which is essentially a, <coughs> a hedgehog without spines. It's a, a big shrew, if you want it. It's about this size. It's actually now found in the island of Hispaniola, in this particular case. And there's another uh, form, similar to this one, which is only found in Cuba. So these animals have been isolated there through changes in the surrounding areas in the surrounding land. 
And of course, endemic species are very important for us. And they're very important for us because in many ways, these endemic forms are a bit like Mona Lisa's of the natural world. And these are masterpieces of nature, if you want. They have generated these new different forms and therefore it is uh, up to us in the conservation world, certainly throughout the world, to be able to do as much as we can to protect them. And one of the ways that we can do that is by actually mapping the distribution of different concentrations of endemic species. Endemic species defined here by species that are only found in certain areas of the world. And here you can see that islands are incredibly important in terms of endemic uh, species diversity. Galapagos Islands are very much the jewel of the crown in terms of uh, species that have become something different, uh, there's endemicity. The Philippines are incredibly important as well. All the Pacific Islands, although mostly uh, important for birds, uh, because many other forms find it difficult to get there, um, bird diversity and endemic bird diversity is particularly important in the Pacific Islands. But you have other islands like the Mascarines, um, Mauritius, Rodrigues, um, and Comores over here, and the Gulf of Guinea Islands, and so on, that are incredibly important for us to conserve because they maintain, they are the custodians of life forms that are found in all the rest of the world. And one of the things that we have to do is to not only count the number of endemic forms, I'll give you some examples here in terms of higher plants. We've got levels of endemism which are incredibly high. Almost every single plant that's found in New Zealand is actually found only in New Zealand. It's endemic to the island of New Zealand. You can uh, do the same thing for other forms like uh, <coughs> land snails. Land snails, because they don't have a great level of mobility between islands, of course, are going to become something different. And if you look at Madagascar, almost all the snails, all the land snails are found on that <coughs> island, are endemic to Madagascar, again, because of the, the importance of that. And we've always focused on islands uh, such as Galapagos, not just because of the beauty of the different types that are found within them, endemic to those areas, like the marine iguana, etc., but also because they do allow us to understand the process of speciation and the process of changes that occur through time when you get animals uh, isolated on you know, a bunch of rocks over the sea. And when we talk about um, that process of speciation, we have to usually turn to the wonderful Darwin's finches. It wasn't actually Darwin himself who talked about um, the differentiation of beak forms, etc., on the Galapagos, it was somebody after him, he was much more interested, he actually clicked on the di diversification of species on islands by looking at mockingbirds rather than looking at Darwin's finches. He obviously collected Darwin's finches, he had enough information about Darwin's finches, but a lot of the work that he did surrounded was actually much more focused on the other life forms on the Galapagos Islands. But as you can see, if you study the changes of one ancestral form on the Galapagos Islands, you study um, these evolutionary processes of adaptations to conditions that are found in one island, perhaps not in the other. So what we can do is what uh, some um, scientists have done, is look at the whole process of colonization. You have one form rapidly sort of colonizing uh, one island, San Cristobal, and bit by bit emerging or colonizing all the other islands until you have that wonderful flurry of different life forms, different forms that are adapted to the conditions. As you can see, you can have some looking very different morphologically, similar beak sort of thing, but we also know that this is not a process that has finished once we started uh, studying them. In fact, evolution is still going on. And therefore, when we look at beak sizes, for example, or beak size, as in the case of this uh, medium grand finch, you can see that there are changes in the beak, and therefore changes that will 
uh, affect the form, uh, the, like the look of the species, simply because there are differing climatic conditions happening on the island over time. And here we can see this is work done by uh, Grant, uh, uh, a couple that have been working on Darwin's finches for a long, long time. As you can see, sort of the beak depth changes according to whether you, do, you have dry years or wetter years. So evolution is still very much in process. It doesn't, have, it doesn't end when we write our papers. It's always sort of happening there and then. And the main problem that we have on islands is the fact that we humans have been responsible for the demise. I've told you right at the beginning, the beginning that <laughs> island forms have disappeared. We've had about 75 to 80 percent of all the life forms that we know about that have disappeared because of human actions. And the most spectacular ones, for example, are uh, things like the dodo, which is essentially a, a pigeon that has overgrown in size, gigantism in the island of, of uh, Mauritius. We also have elephant birds, an enormous beast uh, only found in Madagascar, also seem to have disappeared after the entry of humankind on the island. And of course, moas, also very large ostrich-like birds in New Zealand that through man's action have, are no longer present. And man's action means also the action of his uh, uh, greatest friends. Uh, if you look at what causes most of the uh, loss of species on islands, you have these guys to blame. Uh, cats and dogs in particular, and even pigs, have been responsible for destroying the habitat in which uh, island animals are formed, are, are found, and obviously even sort of predation on them. After all, island forms, island animals, uh, and even plants, are naive uh, animals and plants. They have not been exposed to predation, they have not been exposed to uh, being uh, herbivory, for example, being eaten by other, uh, by herbivores, by big animals. So therefore, they are very susceptible to any predator, any herbivore, in fact, and any carnivore comes in contact with them. So in a small space of time, you can have very large numbers of animals disappearing because of the actions of these invasive species. So part of the problem that we have is how do we actually do away with the constant problem of things like black rats. It's far easier to get rid of goats, for example, than it has been done in Galapagos. Um, you can get rid of pigs because you can go out and shoot them, poison them, but it's certainly far more difficult to get rid of them than like black rats. Black rats are incredibly uh, abundant in all of these islands, and therefore to get rid of them is a major, major task. There are attempts being made by a number of conservation organizations to get rid of black rats on islands, there's an, uh, a conservation organization known as Island Conservation that does that. We did that in Durham and a number of islands in the Caribbean that are now free of uh, black rats precisely through the actions of the conservation organizations such as ours. Was. And again, emphasizing the point that in terms of extinctions, we have to be careful uh, about those animals and plants that are still found on islands because they will disappear if we don't do anything about that. And like I've said, you can actually do something about eradicating the invasive species <coughs> that has been attempted, still goes on in places like uh, Galapagos. Uh, there have been a major attempt to eradicate uh, invasive rodents in this island, uh, the Sombrero Chino, uh, where the, there is a population of Galapagos hawks, and Galapagos hawks are endemic to that area, and what has had to be done is to remove all the hawks, try to get rid of all the rodents, and then in due time, in due course, put those hawks back again. So you can imagine sort of the effort and the expense of actually re, um, restoring islands like that, but, you know, through getting rid of these guys. So we keep on sort of talking about uh, you know, what can we do nowadays in, in terms of conservation biology? What can we do in terms of restoring these islands that still have endemic life forms to uh, what they used to be? 
or something similar to what was there, through eliminating invasive species, through actually making sure that this doesn't happen. And this is one of the major threats that we have in islands nowadays, and, and that is the overpopulation of human beings in a lot of these islands. This is an extreme case, of course, um, but you have situations like in, the, in Galapagos, but you've got more and more people coming to the island simply because it's a wonderful place for tourism and therefore for business. So the population of human beings, of residents of Galapagos, have actually soared in the last few years simply because the numbers of visitors and tourists has actually gone up. And, you know, the interest of the tourists is great because you have wonderful things like marine iguanas and other species there. You have the, the birthplace, so to speak, of evolution in those islands, and they're magnificent to, to watch and see, but at the same time, they themselves can be a threat to uh, the life. And you have to be careful nowadays not just to look at what's going to happen to these, uh, um, to the biodiversity find of islands because of the invasives and because of overpopulation, etc. This is an example of overpopulation. This is an island in the Maldives. But what has to be our concern as well nowadays is that climate change is going to affect not only sort of the, um, the animals and plants that are found in low-lying islands, but it's certainly going to affect sort of human beings, as in this particular case. This is an island in the Maldives. Maldives uh, government actually are now constructing a, um, or thinking seriously about uh, sea level change and how they must be thinking of even constructing artificial islands to repopulate with the people that they've got in these islands that are likely to be covered with water in no time at all. So our challenge is, is major. It's major because we are supposedly the custodians of this uh, wonderful biodiversity that's found on islands. Uh, remember, 50% of all the animals, uh, certainly sort of birds and all that, are found within 20%. Uh, sorry, not, uh, are found within the islands. But we have to make sure that there is a correct balance uh, met between sort of the needs of people living in these islands and actually the uh, biodiversity found within them. And I think the greatest challenge in conservation is precisely that. How do we actually do what we have to do for wildlife? And it's all very good to think about wildlife on its own, but unfortunately, we also, fortunately, we have to put our heads together to come up with solutions to people that live with those animals and plants in the world. The world is not just for wildlife, at least that, that's my, um, my take, it is there also for us to enjoy, but we have to enjoy it responsibly. And therefore, we have to seek ways in which we can...